All right. Well, we're here to talk about snot. <laughs> so anyway, so they, they, there are oftentimes people to ask me, you know, why'd you go into ENT? I mean, snot and earwax? What good is that? And I'll tell you, nobody takes their clothes off in my office. So it's pretty nice. Uh, there are a bunch of things about sinusitis I'm going to try and get through. I'm going to start out and try and talk about what is it, particularly what are they? What are sinuses? Uh, what happens to them? And then what is sinusitis? What happens when we get sinusitis? How do we talk about it? So starting out with the anatomy of the sinuses. Now, the word sinus is just a, a blind-ended pouch with a, an opening into the outside. So there are lots of different kinds of sinuses. You can have little cysts with sinus tracts coming out. So a sinus isn't necessarily a, a, a normal structure. The word just means open, or sorry, closed pouch with an, a drainage pathway to the outside. Now you have uh, several sets of sinuses. You've got sinuses in your forehead up in here called your frontal sinuses. You've got these cheek sinuses called your maxillary sinuses because it's in your maxillary bone. You've got sinuses between your eyes called the ethmoids. Okay, those, if you're looking from the front, sit right between your eyes here. And then there's a big one in the center of your head called the sphenoid sinus. Now, if you imagine taking a, a slice of someone's face like this, you can imagine this is the, the eye socket here. So the, the eyeball sits in here and here. And here's the cheek sinus. The, the nose is divided into two sides by what's called the nasal septum. And then off the side, there are these, those little, these things are called turbinates. They're little radiators for your nose. So if you think about what the nose does, the nose is there to humidify and to filter out the dust and the stuff in the sinuses. Well, the, the radiators are a big part of how that gets done. And specifically, we're going to look at the middle turbinate. There's an inferior turbinate, a middle turbinate, and then farther back, there's a superior turbinate, but it's very small. But the middle turbinate is really kind of the crux of the matter because under the middle turbinate is where the opening into these sinuses exist. And in fact, if you look at the ethmoid sinuses and the frontal sinuses and the maxillary sinuses, they all drain out into this one little area, which is no bigger than a millimeter or two wide. Okay? And we call that the osteomedial complex, because doctors have to have big words for things. Right? So that osteomedial complex, osteo means bone, meatus means opening, and it's this complex of bone and mucosa. Now mucosa in the nose makes, not surprisingly, mucus. Right? The mucosa in the nose also has little cilia. Cilia are like hair cells or, or brooms. And so those cilia beat and they sweep the snot out of your sinus and into your nose and then into the back of your throat and you swallow it down. Right? And that happens all day long. Now those cilia know where that opening is and so they sweep towards that opening. Now if you've got an extra opening somewhere else, the cilia don't know that. They keep sweeping to the normal opening. And in the cheek sinus, it's pretty, it's pretty obvious where they would sweep to. But in the frontal sinus, they do sort of a strange thing. They sweep across the roof to the outside, and then they sweep along the floor down to this opening called the frontal sinus recess. So a lot of what happens in sinus disease is to do with that little area, this osteomedal complex. So what do they do? Why do we have sinuses? Well, there are, there are a number of things. One of them is they're sort of like the guitar, the, the body of a guitar. They're the resonance chamber. If you, didn't have, if you didn't have sinuses, your voice wouldn't echo as much. So when you go to choir practice and they tell you to sing up here and not down here, they're talking, trying to get your sinuses to resonate. They're also kind of like the crumple zone in your car, right? So you get in a head-on collision and the whole front of your car crumples first. Well. If you look at this, the crumple zone of your face is right here. And so if you take a, a direct, pardon me, that's AV. Uh, if you take a direct hit to the front of the face, that all crumples in. And it's actually very uncommon to get brain injuries from the front unless it's a really incredible amount of force because those sinuses absorb some of the force. They also kind of minimize the weight of your head, kind of like a bird's bones are hollow. Well, so are the bones of your face. And then they function as part of this humidifier and filter for your, for your breathing. 
So the sinus, what is sinusitis, the sinus we talked about, itis just means inflammation, right? So arthritis is inflammation of your joints. Well, sinusitis is just inflammation of your sinuses. And in, in this case, we're talking specifically about what we call the paranasal sinuses, next to your nose sinuses. Now, this is not, by definition, a bacterial infection. This is inflammation. So there are lots of things that can cause inflammation. Well, in fact, there are lots of things here. So we've got viral inflammation. And this is by far the most common, right, the common cold. Rhinoviruses and adenoviruses and coronaviruses and even really bad colds or even the flu are all viral infections. Allergic uh, rhinitis, this is inflammation caused by an inappropriate amount of inflammation that your immune system generates uh, when it's exposed to things. So more and more people are having allergies. We're not entirely sure why, but that leads to inflammation of your nose. Inflammation causes obstruction and more snot to be made, that sort of stuff. Bacterial is what most people are wondering about because this is what is really frustrating. This is the one that lasts for two, three weeks. This is the one that you need to get the antibiotics for. Uh, there are lots of different bacteria, but these are the three most common ones that cause sinusitis. It can be caused by all sorts of things. It's just a matter of what's in your nose and what's it getting infected with. Fungal sinusitis is actually much less common. I'm not going to talk as much about this because it's, it's more, uh, more rare. So how often does this happen? Well, about one out of 10 adults gets a sinus infection annually. It makes about 35 million people a year, about 16 million office visits a year. In studies, about 90 to 98% of these are viral. 70% of these patients are going to get better even if you just give them a sugar pill. Okay, so most of the time, you're going to get better on your own. However, 81% of people that went in got some antibiotics. And I'm, I point this out because if we're talking about four or three and a, a third billion dollars a year in treatment for sinusitis and about one and three quarters of that for children, that's an awful lot of money when you consider that a decent portion of this is inappropriate treatment, okay? So what happens when we get sinusitis? Well, again, we're gonna start up at the, the starting point, which is the inflammation. Now, the inflammation leads to swelling of your nose. Anybody that's had a cold knows that your nose gets plugged up, right, because the lining swells up. So you get this mucosal swelling, right? Well, as that mucosa swells, that lining, if that hole is only a millimeter wide, it doesn't take much to swell it shut, right? So now you've got osteum obstruction. Osteum is just, again, the fancy word for hole, right? The hole's getting blocked up, and then you end up with what's called mucus stasis. Fancy way of saying that the mucus doesn't sweep out. It doesn't clear out of the sinuses. Now, biofilms, I'll talk a little bit more about that later, but it's just mucus that won't, won't go away. Well, mucus has sugar and protein in it, so eventually it gets infected. Well, what does infection do? Infection causes inflammation, which causes mucosal swelling, which causes osteo obstruction, which causes, right? And three weeks later, you're still doing this, okay? So how, what, how do we classify sinusitis? It turns out this is actually very, very difficult. This is very hard to tell you what causes sinusitis. It's a, and I'm going to go through this a little bit, but there are a bunch of different ways to classify this. So, Probably the most common one is just how long does it last, right? If it's less than three weeks, we call it an acute sinusitis. If it's greater than 12 weeks, we call it a chronic sinusitis. Three to 12 is subacute. And then some people have infections that kind of never really seem to go away, but they certainly get worse at times. So we call that chronic with acute exacerbation. Sometimes we classify it by the, the cause of the inflammation, so allergic or viral or bacterial or fungal or immunologic. Now, when, when doctors get together, right, and you can imagine this is an incredibly riveting conversation with a bunch of rhinologists, right, but we talk about the histologic findings, meaning what does the tissue look like under the microscope? And so we break it down into what's called chronic rhinosinusitis, CRS, with, without polyposis and with polyposis. Okay, now polyposis, a polyp in your sinuses, is normal tissue, it's not a tumor, it's not a cancer, 
but it's just swollen way beyond normal tissue. Okay? Now, there are a number of theories about this, and this is the part that we don't understand very well. But one of the, one of the kinds of uh, sinusitis with polyposis has a certain kind of white blood cell called an eosinophil, and we think that that's to do with allergies. Some of them, uh, there was a group in, uh, at Mayo Clinic, a, a Swedish fellow who came and worked at the Mayo Clinic uh, in the 90s, started culturing fungus out of pe patients with sinusitis. When he started, 100% he, of people got fungus cultured out of their sinuses if they had sinusitis. Well, all sinusitis must be caused by fungus, right? Well, it turns out that 99% of people without sinusitis get fungus cultured out of their sinuses too. So, but there probably is something to do with fungus and probably something to do with your allergic response to it. Now, the invasive fungal sinusitis is really limited to uh, bone marrow transplant chemotherapy patients. So that, don't, don't get too worked up about that. So, I'm, I'm gonna, again going to go over this. The, the without polyposis is by far the majority of people. Okay? With polyposis is much less common. Now this is a picture of a patient that was undergoing surgery for chronic rhinosinusitis without polyposis. This is the middle, so this is the left side of the nose. This is that middle turbinate. This is the side wall of the nose. Underneath this turbinate there's a little hood of tissue and we looked at that before when you were looking at the, the cross section. That little hood of tissue is called the uncinate process and Underneath that tissue is where the cheek sinus hole is, the, the maxillary sinus osteum, and also where a lot of the drainage pathway for the other ones is. Now this is a patient with polyposis, and this is actually pretty mild polyposis. Some patients have polyps filling up this entire cavity, but this was an easier way to show what it looked like. Here's that middle turbinate again. Now this is on the right side of the patient, so this is the septum here, the wall between the two sides. This is the side wall of the nose, and this is the middle turbinate. Here you can see that uncinate process, that normal band of tissue, but this is a polyp. Now polyps have this kind of battleship gray looking appearance. They don't have this nice pink healthy looking appearance because they're just really, really swollen and inflamed. Okay? Now this is a much more complex problem. This is very difficult to treat. Luckily it's much less common. So I'm going to talk primarily about this. Now, if, at its very base level, this is an architectural problem. The hole is too small, right? So the hole swells shut. So how do we figure out if you've got sinusitis or not? There, we can go with clinical descriptions, meaning what are your symptoms like? How do you feel? We can go with radiographic pictures like CT scans and so forth. Or we can go with endoscopic. So those were endoscopic pictures, cameras up in your nose. In the, kind of in the 90s, as uh, development of our understanding of sinusitis was really exploding, there was a, a, again, famous is pretty relative when you're talking about rhinologists, but a guy named Don Lanza did a study in which he kind of figured out what are the major and the minor symptoms of sinusitis. And it's kind of set up like, like a Chinese restaurant menu. This is the list A and this is the list B. These are the ones that are pretty consistently associated with sinusitis. Your face hurts. You can't breathe out of your nose. You got snot and pus draining out of your nose. You can't smell. You got a fever. Those are the things that if you have two of these things, we basically say, yes, you have a sinusitis. Now these are the things like headaches, fever, bad breath, fatigue, dental pain. These things are caused by lots of things. You can't really have dental pain without pus coming out of your nose and think that your dental pain is from your sinusitis, right? So what he came up with is he basically said two major symptoms or one major symptom and two minor symptoms. And for the most part when we define sinusitis for the purposes of studying it or diagnosing it, this is what we go with. There are other things that play into it. So for example, how long it lasts. Right? We, we generally say a virus lasts seven to ten days presuming your immune system is relatively normal. Anything over about 10 days, you start to wonder, is this still a virus? Your body should have cleared that out. So another one of those classic symptoms is your body is getting rid of the cold, but then, and it's, it's getting better, but then after that initial improvement, things start to get bad again. Right? 
And we call that also waxing and waning symptoms. It gets better, it gets worse. It gets better, it gets worse. And it kind of goes over and over like that. And then endoscopic diagnosis is just you look in there with a camera and you say, hey, look, that's, that's pus. It's coming out of the nose. And that's hard to argue with. Now we can take pictures, too. So there's regular old x-rays and CT scans and MRIs. Regular x-rays, they call them plain films, are really not very useful. And this is primarily because you're taking a, a three-dimensional structure and you're shooting a picture of it and projecting it onto a two-dimensional plane. It doesn't work very well. So your forehead sinuses are sort of obscured by the bone of your skull and your cheek sinuses are as well. Your ethmoid sinuses are obscured by the other bones in your face. They're not very useful. I, I don't think that I've ever actually ordered one of these. So, Now, CT scans are really the gold standard. This is what we use to, to look at sinuses. It gives us very good discrimination of bone, which is white, black, which is air, and then gray, which is everything in between. So you've got your eyeball here inside your eye socket. Your brain is up here, and then this is where your smell nerve comes out. And then your cheek sinuses, and you can see this drainage pathway. Here's that osteomedial complex. And then this little band of tissue called the uncinate process. Okay. This, is, this is very useful as a map. It's very good at, at showing us what is in there. However, if you get a cold, 70 to 90 percent of people with a viral cold will have sim or signs of sinusitis on a CT scan. The other thing is, as we've done studies looking at what does your CT scan look versus how do you feel, it turns out the correlation is really not very good. I have had a lot of patients who have horrible, horrible symptoms and a pretty normal looking CT scan. And I've actually had a patient who I looked at a CT scan and every time we got one I thought, man, I can't believe you can continue breathing. And he felt fine. So this isn't that great a test from the standpoint of do you have a problem. It's a very good test for what does the problem look like inside. Now, MRI is much better at looking at soft things. Okay? CT scans are absorbed by bone. MRIs show you soft things. And it's not very good at showing you bony tissue. Well, you can imagine that this is mainly the difference between bone and air. Well, MRIs don't do that very well. But what MRIs are very good at doing is uh, looking at uh, tissues with lots of fluid in them. So inflamed tissues show up very brightly on MRIs. Well, the problem with that is that if you look at 68% of kids with a cold, they've got signs of sinusitis on their CT scan. But if you look at 42% of kids without a cold, they've got signs of sinusitis on an MRI. I'm sorry, on an MRI. So this is very, very sensitive and perhaps too sensitive. Right, because if I did surgery or treatment for everybody that had findings of MRI sinusitis, half of normal healthy kids would be getting treatment. Well, that's, that doesn't seem right. So I reiterate, this is a clinical diagnosis primarily on that major and minor symptoms scale. So how do we treat it? I and mean, what are we going to do about sinusitis? Well, we've got basically two options. We can do medical treatment or we can do surgical treatment. Now the medical treatment, I'm going to put this up here more than anything just to tell you that allergies are really complicated and I'm not going to explain it all right now. But we don't actually really understand the whole concept of what's going on. We kind of know what's happening, but we don't necessarily know why. But in the context of allergic inflammation, basically what we want to do is we want to try and stop that allergic inflammation with allergy treatment. We'll Sometimes use some decongestant, so you'll see a lot of Claritin D. The D means decongestant or pseudoephedrine. And then we'll use stuff like mucinex or uh, guifenesin is the, is the generic name of this stuff. <clears throat> I also want to talk a little bit about saline irrigation. So saline, ir saline is salt water. Uh, this is just the most common brand of it, but it's just salt water. There's nothing magical about this stuff. Um, the, the importance of saline is that it's the appropriate salt concentration. If you take anybody that's ever been in a pool and got water up in their nose, knows that that stings like crazy, right? That's, that's not good for you. Pure water going up in your body is not right, but water that has salt in it in the appropriate concentration 
to the salt that's inside your cells actually is very soothing, right? That's why contact solution doesn't sting your eyes. The other thing is if you put cold water in your nose, you'll get a wicked, wicked headache. But if you put body temperature water in your nose, it's not too bad. This is intended to be a very high volume, meaning eight ounces of fluid, but under really low pressure. This is not, I mean, you're not trying to power wash your nose out. You're just trying to rinse the snot out of there, okay? Now, I do want to kind of hit on this because this is, there, there are a number of questions that come up about this. Clean versus distilled versus boiled water. So uh, hundreds of millions of doses of this stuff are, are used every year. Well, I think there are three or four reported cases of, of people who got what's called amoebic encephalitis. So encephalitis is an infection inside your, inside your brain. And amoebas are kinds of microorganisms that live in certain water supplies, particularly in your pipes. It turns out that a number of these were down in Louisiana, which makes me kind of wonder about Louisiana's water quality, but <coughs> different story. So the big question is, should you use clean tap water versus distilled water versus boiled water? I personally am okay with using tap water. I use tap water. My kid, I put tap water into my kid's nose. I feel comfortable with my pipes, and I feel comfortable with city water supply, so I'm okay with that. But distilled water is a reasonably good source, and boiled water is obviously going to be sterile. One note, though, boiled water isn't sterile until you've boiled it for 11 minutes. So just because it reached a boil doesn't mean it's sterile. The hardest part about these two is making it body temperature again. It's pretty easy to make your tap water body temperature. You just get a thermometer. It's a lot harder to do it. And then the last thing is, I really think that frequent cleaning of the bottle is very important. So at least once a week, you got to put it through the dishwasher on the sterilized cycle or whatever they call it. And it's probably once a month or so you ought to replace the bottle. Whether you use the neti pot thing or the, the bottle, it doesn't really matter. All we're talking about is doing getting lots of water in there. So anybody that's taken high school chemistry remembers the solution to pollution is dilution. Sorry. Thought I'd give it a shot. So anyway, so treatment for allergies. <clears throat> this is probably the most common one. People know a lot of these are over the counter. So antihistamines, Claritin, Zyrtec, Wallatin, you know, all these things, they're all basically the same family of drugs. You might have some res better response to others versus the other. There's not an enormous difference between them, uh, but in general, these are sort of our first line treatments. Anti-leukotriene inhibitors, you probably, I don't know if any, has anybody heard of Singular? Si Singular is a pretty common medication. It's, I, I, don't, I don't lean heavily on Singular. I, I don't find it to be quite as useful in the nose, although pulmonologists and asthma doctors tend to find this quite useful. So I wouldn't poo-poo it. I just, I don't, alone, a standalone drug is not that useful to me. The next class of medications would be topical medications, so nasal sprays that you spray up in your nose. So steroids are things like Flonase or Rhinocord or Nasonex or Nasacord and Aquacord and Aquanet and all this stuff. So again, those are all very similar, okay? There, all, there are differences in the, the kind of molecule that you're using, but they're all basically the same idea. It's a steroid, which is, it's not like Barry Bond steroids. It's, a, it's an anti-inflammatory steroid. So it's supposed to reduce the amount of swelling inside, your, inside the tissue. You can also actually get antihistamines, which is sprayed directly up into your nose. There's something called patinase, and you can use that. And then anticholinergics, which basically are a, they block the work order from your brain to your nose to make snot. So they just kind of dry it out. You may have heard of anticholinergic effects. A lot of people have medications that dry out their eyes and dry out their mouth. It's the same basic idea. <coughs> now, the last treatment for allergies and kind of the top rung is immunotherapy, which is divided basically into injection versus sublingual drops. I'm going to talk about this a second. It's very hard to find pictures that glamorize either sublingual drops or injections. I'll tell you that right now. But subcutaneous immunotherapy is the thing that you go to the allergist and you get the weekly injections into your, into your arm. And it, it basically is... Uh, the most effective and, and really the FDA approved version of immunotherapy. Now sublingual immunotherapy is, that we've, is something that we've started doing recently in our office. It is very, very common in Europe, 
but for a variety of primarily political reasons, this is not FDA approved. It's all basically the same idea. I mean, it's the idea of desensitizing your body to something it doesn't like. So you're kind of pushing on your immune system to say, relax a little bit, you're gonna be okay. Because none of this stuff is, you know, cat dander isn't inherently dangerous. Your body just thinks it is. So this is a little bit different in that it's drops that you put into your mouth. It's a bottle that you keep at, at your home instead of, uh, instead of going to the doctor's office. It is somewhat safer just because you're not bypassing your body's innate defenses, primarily your skin or your, the lining of your body. However, it comes with a downside, and that's it's not quite as effective and it's not quite as diverse. We don't have as many antigens or allergens that we can go against. So, Now, so moving on to viral sinusitis. This is another one where the inflammation occurs. It, it's from the virus this time. So we use some decongestants to try and block the, the mucosal swelling, and we use the mucolytics and the saline irrigation. But generally, we've, we're, we're kind of stuck with over-the-counter treatment. Now, it turns out that antihistamines are not helpful. You don't need to take Claritin because there's no proof that that works. Uh, there's no proof that echinacea or vitamin C or enemas or any of this stuff works. The one thing that was ever proven, uh, they brought a bunch of college kids down to a hotel in Florida and gave some, they gave them all the cold virus. And the ones that slept more than eight hours a night got fewer symptoms and they got less colds. So, Lots of sleep, lots of uh, relaxing and rest and fluids and hot stone massages. I don't care. Whatever makes you feel good. But there's no cure for the common cold. So antibiotics are contraindicated, meaning you shouldn't take antibiotics for this. Uh, a lot of people like to say, well, just in case I want to take this. Well, there are downsides to antibiotics. Uh, there are downsides to you. I mean, people get diarrhea and yeast infections and upset stomach and that sort of stuff. But there are also downsides to using too many of them, right? I mean, we do stupid things with antibiotics. We spray it on cow feed. We do, we do things like that. And now we've got a lot of resistance. So those three bacteria that I showed you at the beginning, well, amoxicillin used to be the first line treatment for sinusitis, for bacterial sinusitis. Now something like 30, 40% of bacteria that you find in the community are resistant to amoxicillin. So moving on. So now we get to real acute bacterial sinusitis, right? So now, either from a virus or from allergies or from infection in general, you've got this inflammation. You've got the mucosal swelling, the obstruction, the mucus stasis, and the infection, and we're doing this. So now we do the same kind of thing. We shrink down the lining of the nose, we wash out the snot and try and thin it out, and then we add in an antibiotic. So amoxicillin was one, and azithromycin or Zithromax, you know, z -Pak, that's another one, or Cipro. There are a variety of medications, and there are a number of really good broad-spectrum medications which take care of this. Now, once we passed the 12-week mark, not inherently, but around there, we say now we're getting into a situation where we're talking about a longer duration of a stronger antibiotic. So, say your amoxicillin failed or was resistant or it wasn't long enough. So generally, the, the hard part about treating sinusitis with bacteria is that the infection is not actually inside your body. If you imagine where the infection is, it's in the snot that's collecting in the sinus, which is attached to the outside of your body. There, there's no blood flowing through the infected snot. So antibiotics take a quite a long time to kind of seep out through the lining of the sinuses in the mucus before it really gets it done. So oftentimes seven days or five days is not enough. We've got to go more like two weeks or I've even done three or four weeks. Okay. And then the other thing is you can start adding in things to reduce the inflammation. So you can either do the topical steroids, but you can also do oral steroids, pill steroids. And then that flows up into the sinuses. In particular, in patients with polyps, you can spray all you want. It's just going to bounce off the front of that thing. It's not going to go in. So using the oral steroids can, can oftentimes significantly help. Now, there are some downsides to using all these medications, right? I mean, the, the more potent antibiotics are much more likely to cause the diarrhea. They're much more likely to cause the upset stomach. And steroid pills, in particular, have some risks. Particularly, the first day or two, most people have a lot of trouble sleeping. 
people get an upset stomach. Uh, uh, there, there are some risks that I've never really seen because I use pretty low doses of it. But there are complications to doing this. And then uh, now we're getting into this chronic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyposis. That's how doctors write it. Um, so now we're talking about topical steroids, mechanical debridement, meaning instead of just using irrigation, we're going to try and flush the sinuses out. You might even come into the office and I'll try and vacuum them out. Uh, some people have used those water picks. You know, they stick it up in their nose and they power wash it out. Uh, and then actually this, there's, a, there's a group at uh, University of Pennsylvania that did some studies on using baby shampoo in the salt water. Uh, it doesn't burn your eyes. Well, it doesn't burn your nose either. And it's very good at breaking up what's called the biofilm. So I'm going I'm to circle back around and talk about this biofilm thing. So if you imagine what snot is, it's just water with lots and lots of protein in it. And the protein are these long strings of amino acids stuck together. And those long strings kind of weave into each other, almost like rebar and concrete. And it makes that stuff slippery, and it makes it sticky. Now, in the little weavings of those proteins are where bacteria like to sit. And so there's pretty good evidence that as those, that layer, that layer of snot gets stuck down on the mucosa, now those brooms aren't able to sweep it out, and that bacteria sits on it. And so you can either power wash it off with mechanical debridement, or you can use surfactants. A surfactant is just dish soap, right? So soap breaks up oil and proteins and these sorts of things and cleans it off. And then systemic steroids, you know, prednisone and pill steroids, becomes a lot more important because we have to try and somehow reduce your body's drive to make uh, inflammation. Now, Kind of by definition, whenever drugs fail, that's when you start talking about surgery. So the primary goal of any surgery, any, any sinus procedure, is basically to try and open that hole and get the snot to come out. Right? The hole's too small, make it a little bit bigger. Uh, we used to make it massively bigger, and it turns out that's not a very good idea. You've got to kind of be careful about what you do, as with most things in the body. But if you can make this hole a little bit bigger, uh, then generally you'll be able to irrigate better. The sinuses will be able to clear themselves out. And it won't swell shut quite as easily. Okay? There's actually a pretty good study recently that looked at this uncinate process to this wall right here. And they looked at the diameter of that tunnel. And if that distance is less than a millimeter, you're highly more likely to end up having sinusitis. Okay? That kind of makes sense. It's pretty basic architecture. Now, in the 30s through about the 1980s, uh, as surgery was kind of developing, they did what was called endonasal surgery, which is basically just you got this little nasal speculum, and doctors would wear a headlight, and it would shine light down through there, and you would do work inside the nose. And it was, I got to tell you, I'm, I'm impressed. It's pretty brave to do that stuff, because there's some important stuff up there. But this is basically how surgery was done until kind of the 1980s. And then in the, in the 60s through the 70s, they started really refining what's called fiber optic technology, right? So this is how you get image from one end of the camera to the lens right here. And it's just a, lo a, lot, of fi a lot of fiberglass rods that deliver that image, okay? <clears throat> now, they refine this, this is called a Hopkins rod, they, they, they make the, Carl Stortz makes this. They refine this and they are also able to make it so it points straight forward or it looks 30 degrees or 45 degrees or 70 degrees off to the side. So this thing is about four millimeters across and you can stick it up in the nose and that's where those pictures that I showed you came from, from a camera like this. And this was really pioneered by a, a couple of guys in, in Austria. And I've actually heard this guy speak, kind of a funny, jolly guy. Um, but they did a lot of the initial work. And then there's a guy named David Kennedy who was, uh, who was newly minted as a, a professor at Johns Hopkins in the 80s. And his, he wanted to be an ear surgeon. Uh, but his boss said, no, David, you're going to go to Austria. And he, he did a, a, a summer uh, a internship with these guys and came back and sort of became the father of, of modern endoscopic sinus surgery. 
Uh, and he's the one that did this, some of the studies in uh, Pennsylvania. They also spent an enormous amount of energy and money developing instruments. So initially, you can imagine I, you got to go up through the nose with a four millimeter camera. Well, you can't take a soup spoon up there. So you, you know you got to you got to have instruments that can gently handle the tissue and open those sinuses up without causing any trouble. So companies spend a lot of uh, engineering feats to try and make instruments that would do these things through the nose and around corners. And then recently there have been even more developments. The, the main ones, high resolution CT scanning was a massive change. Uh, David Kennedy worked with a guy named Jin Zinreich uh, at Hopkins and they really sort of burst the whole idea of how you read a CT scan and how these things get done. And as these things have gotten better, we have much, much, much better understanding of what is where, what's behind what. And the complication rates have gone down massively to the point where they're negligible. As CT scanning got better, we also developed what was called 3D image guidance. So you take the CT scan and you load it into a computer. And then when you're asleep in the operating room, we fix this, this uh, head headpiece to your head, and we register your head to the computer, and then we can use that and kind of pin, pinpoint where whatever instrument we're holding is pointing at. So you can see what's on the other side of what I'm pointing at, because you can't see through it. So that has been very, very helpful, especially in the context of very complex sinus surgery. Uh, the micro debrider. I, I don't know if anybody ever remembers that, that infomercial about the Floby. You remember that thing that would cut hair and it was off the vacuum? A lot of, not a lot of late night TV watchers. <laughs> so anyway, so this thing is it's called the micro debrider. And this, again, this thing is about four millimeters across. And this thing opens up and then you can see these little teeth. And the, it suctions and then it, cur it turns like this. And so it's very good at sucking a little bit of tissue in and biting it off. And so what it'll do is, in particular, really inflame stuff like polyps. It'll suction it in there and then cut it off. But it doesn't do that as aggressively with normal tissue. Now, I have a video of this if anybody really wants to see it, but I didn't put it in here in case anybody didn't really want to see it. Um, and then the other one that a lot of people are talking about recently is, is this balloon dilation of the sinus ostium. Now, the balloon dilation is, is a a pretty old idea, right? I mean, you've probably heard of people getting their, their heart blood vessels stretched out, right? Or people getting their esophagus stretched out. This is something called the Seldinger technique. You put a wire in something, and as long as you know the wire's where it's supposed to be, you slide a balloon over it like a train track, the balloon's where it's supposed to be, you stretch it out, and you make the hole bigger. So this is a, it's a little bit newer technology, but again, it's all basically designed to make a hole a little bit bigger. Uh, this, the, the balloon dilation was invented, really refined probably six or seven years ago, so there aren't any really long-term studies. Uh, the, the most recent study, or the longest term study I've seen shows that the hole is still stretched open two years later. So I mean, the, the thought is that it, the thought of that is that it does pretty well. <coughs> yeah, I don't, know, I don't know that we really know that. Um, what I can tell you is that, um, well, let's look at it here. So this is where that one millimeter hole is. Uh, you try and shoot for what is the, the natural ostium, because the hole itself is, is, is a normal diameter, but it's the hood of tissue covering over it that's the problem. So if you can get the, the balloon in there and stretch that hole, that tissue out, or if you can just remove that hood of tissue and look at the hole, that, that is generally adequate. The downside to making it too big is that if you make it huge, dust and dirt and stuff that wasn't supposed to get in there starts to get in there. Um, and that's kind of, I mean, that's why God put the thing there in the first place, right? He doesn't want a lot of, a lot of external stuff going into those sinuses. That's a, a much longer discussion. Um, there, are, there are not many studies that talk about that. There is a guy in Mexico City who claims that it works 100% of the time. Uh, anybody that tells you what they do always works, be real skeptical. His study also only had 25 patients. So 
I am not doing that because I mean, this is not an experimental institution we're talking about. I mean, this is not, there isn't enough evidence to say that we should do that. There have been attempts to do that with other things, dilators and so forth. The real scary thing about that is if you scar that thing closed, you're really up a creek. Then it ain't going to open back up. So that, I think that's really what we're waiting for, is somebody to do a, a broader multi-institution study to prove that it works. So. No. <laughs> it's one of those things that I hate to have to say out loud, but no. Oh, I'm sorry, they asked me to do that. She was, she was asking about using the balloon to stretch open the eustachian tube. Now this is really getting into a, a different area. This is getting into uh, ear disease. The eustachian tube is the tube that connects your nose to your ear. When you pop your ears, the air's going up through there. Uh, the answer basically is yes, there are people who are trying it, but the protocols and the, the success rates of them are not clearly established. Uh, so, in general, what is sinus surgery like? So, it's, a, it's about, depending on the complexity and what your sinuses are like and have you had surgery before, it's about a one to four hour procedure. Most of the time, I, I book them for about an hour, an hour and a half at the most. It's performed under general anesthesia. Most people do it under general anesthesia. Some doctors are more comfortable with doing it under what we call conscious sedation, you know, the twilight sleep. Uh, and actually, that the, the company that makes the balloon uh, is really, really pushing people to do this balloon thing in the office. So we put some numbing stuff in your nose and, and insert the balloon into the opening while you're awake, just in the office. Um, generally, about four to seven days of recovery. And when I say recovery, you've got to understand, I'm, I'm not a general surgeon. I, when I talk about recovery, I'm talking about until you're feeling back to pretty normal. Uh, this isn't belly surgery. You know, you're not. You're going to get up and walk out of the operating or out of the hospital. Uh, it's sore. It feels like you kind of walked into one of those glass doors, and your nose is sore. Uh, most people take pain medications for uh, two, three, four days afterwards. Uh, if you wear a tank top and have barbed wire tattooed around your arm, you're probably going to take pain medications for three or four weeks. That's a whole different story. Little old ladies, I got to tell you, you guys are the toughest folks in the world. It's amazing. Um, medications, usually you take some antibiotics before and a little bit after. Uh, pain medications, and sometimes, in particular with polyps, I'll have people take some steroids. Uh, saline irrigations, I keep coming back to this. Uh, this is really kind of the crux of taking care of this afterwards, after the surgery is done. Cleaning this out is imperative. Just like you get a cut on your hand, wash it and put some ointment on it, heals up in three, four days. Let it dry out, rub a little dirt in it, that thing's going to be there for six weeks. The cleaner, the, uh, the moist, the, the more moist you keep that uh, right after the surgery, the better off we're going to be. So after the surgery, we, we do have you come in and we use the endoscopes in the office. And really this is just to clean out the stuff, make sure there's not crusts and and, and, uh, and snot and stuff building up, and in particular to make sure there's not scar tissue building up. So we call these post-operative debridements. Um, I generally have people come in at a week, at two weeks, and at four weeks. And usually the first one is, is not something you do for giggles on a Friday, but it's, it's not too bad. Uh, it takes about three to five minutes or something like that. Really all I'm trying to do is make sure that scar tissue isn't forming between that radiator, that middle turbinate, and the outside wall of the nose. If that thing scars over, we're right back where we started from, okay? Um, the, Dr. Kennedy actually I, I said recently that I heard him say, about 50% of the success of the surgery is based on doing a good job taking care of your nose after the surgery. Doing a good job in surgery is important, but making sure that this heals well is imperative. Uh, to the point, to the extent that they actually changed how sinus surgeons are paid. They used to pay a lot up front, and then you had to take care of it afterwards. But they said, you're not doing a good enough job. So they cut the cost of the, the surgery in half, and then you get paid for doing a good job afterwards. So there's actually a charge. Unlike most surgeries, there's a charge for coming back afterwards. Um, 
uh, misconceptions, unbearably painful. There, in particular, in the early uh, days of sinus surgery, there was an awful lot of very traumatic work. The instruments weren't refined very well. There was an awful lot of bleeding. Complication rates were quite high. Um, this is not any longer terribly, terribly painful. Now, there are certainly some exceptions. Some people have more inflammation. Some people have more uh, hardening or thickening of the bone. Uh, but in general, most people within a couple of days are done taking pain medications, and they're kind of up back to doing what they want to do. Uh, packing is another thing. When there was all this bleeding in the early days, they'd take six, eight-foot strips of gauze, and they'd kind of shove it in your nose, right? And then you'd come back, and they'd be pulling it out of your nose. And it was awful, right? And it bled like stink. Uh, oops. As, as we get better at doing the surgery, uh, we don't do this anymore. If, if you have a sinus surgeon who's doing this, they probably should retire. Because this, this hasn't been done by anybody who does this well in over a decade. Um, probably, no, probably more than that. No, I, I'm aging. Sorry. Um, sometimes, about a third of the time, I will use a little rubber-coated sponge. And that is to just put a little space between that turbinate and that sidewall. Now, that thing slides out that first week. It stays in there for a few days. You can still breathe. It doesn't hurt generally. Uh, when it comes out in the office, I just kind of reach up in there and pull it out. And most people go, whoa, that was weird. Very few people really say, ouch. So in the context of it helps to make sure that this surgery works, it's well worth it. Um, and then dangerous. The, in the early days, I got I to hand it to those guys because it was, it was pretty rough. I mean, there were a lot of complications. And I, I'll talk about the risks in a minute, but most of the major risks are well under 1%. And in, 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 my, in my career, I'm aging, so that it's getting there. But these are all under a, a tenth of a percent. I've had one major complication in four or 500 surgeries. So it's very uncommon if you're doing this appropriately. Um, now, the risks of the sinus surgery, by far the most important is structures that are around it, right? So the roof of your nose is the floor of your brain. Now, I'm not going to go up in there and, and accidentally suck out second grade, but the fluid that cushions your brain can come leaking out. If there's a fracture of this bone, and you can tell this bone is very thin, if there's a fracture of that bone and some of that fluid comes leaking out, it doesn't seal itself up very quickly or very well. So sometimes we either need to have you come into the hospital and get it to seal itself up, or it even needs to be repaired. Okay? The outside wall of your sinuses are the inside wall of your eyeball. Okay? And so fractures of this or damage to your eye or bleeding into your eyeball, those are all very dangerous. I've never actually seen that happen. It's possible, though. So that's something that has to be very careful about. The, these are the much more common things, bleeding, infection, scarring, uh, recurrence, particularly in the cases of polyposis. You know, uh, having the polyps grow back is not in any way surprising because surgery doesn't stop you from having that innate immune problem. It just makes the hole bigger. Okay? Now, when you've got a lot of sinus disease, this gets an awful lot harder. So whereas this person has a normal sinus CT scan where all the sinuses are full of air, this is a lady who I did surgery on a couple weeks ago, and her nose is completely full of snot, and actually most of this was pus. So it gets a lot harder to tell where you're going when this is all completely filled with inflammation and pus and bleeding and so forth. Okay? When, when should you have sinus surgery? Well, Generally, again, when medications fail, that's the time to do surgery. When symptoms come back quickly after you're done, within a couple of weeks, here you're right back and the symptoms are back and oh, what a pain. Um, when the episodes are becoming so frequent that the risks of the medication are getting worse than the risks of the surgery, you know, it's all risk benefit. So. Uh, from the standpoint of what does it look like? Well, if you don't have symptoms and you don't have findings on your CT scan, don't get surgery. Right? But if you have symptoms and your CT scan says you should, 
then green light, go for surgery. Now, when you don't have findings on your CT scan, but you have symptoms, I think this is a reasonable option because, again, the CT scan doesn't really predict accurately how you feel. So if you have bad symptoms, it's still a reasonable thing. You do have to be very careful. Facial pain, as your primary complaint, is probably not going to get better with sinus surgery, right? Facial pain is caused by lots of things, headaches. Lots of things cause headaches. Now, another closer to red light is if you have bad-looking CT scans, but you don't have symptoms, I would say this is way closer to a red light than it is to a yellow light. You, you really ought to really carefully consider whether that's necessary if you're not feeling too bad. How well does it work? So Dr. Kennedy did one of the first big studies. 97% of 120 patients improved even seven, seven to eight years out after surgery. Okay? I want to highlight this. I didn't put it in yellow, but improvement, okay? not cure. Uh, 150 patients, 12 months after surgery. 80% had improvement from baseline symptoms. This was a little bit more looking at fatigue and vitality and energy and feelings of malaise. This is a, a meta-analysis is when you take a lot of different studies and you pool all the data together and you try and draw conclusions from a bigger test. Well, this identified 28 different studies and they all showed substantial improvement after endoscopic sinus surgery. And by far the most comprehensive, the, Tim Smith was one of the guys that taught me in medical school. And he did a big, and he coordinated a big multi-institutional study and followed 300 patients over about uh, 18 months. Now, he was looking at, he's, he's got his master's in public health, so he did, looks at quality of life. Uh, and you can, you, you can do these questionnaires, and if you ever think ENT doctors don't have a sense of humor, the questionnaire is called a SNOT-20. <laughs> Sinonasal outcomes test. So 75% uh, of people experienced a cl clinically significant improvement. Okay, Now, he was really looking at improvement from your baseline. So there are things that make your baseline lower. There are things that make your baseline higher. And then there are some things that don't seem to really matter. If you have asthma or allergies or your age, it doesn't really matter, and it seems to have no effect on where you start. But the important thing is that basically everybody across the spectrum improves, or I guess I should say improves, right? But everybody improves about the same amount. So if you start down here, you're going to end up here. The long and the short of it is sinus surgery is very effective, but it's unlikely to get you to cure. It's much more likely to get you to better control, less frequent infections, less severe infections, easier to treat with medications if needed. <coughs> uh, that, that's what I just said. So, Sinusitis is really complex. There's lots of things that go into this. Uh, the most common things being most common are the least complicated and the least concerning. There are a lot of different treatments. There are a lot of different modalities, both medical and surgical. And surgical treatment is very effective and it's generally pretty well tolerated. These are my kids. So, do you guys have any questions? I'm sorry. That it's, it's not as... It's not always as helpful. Oh, he told me to do that and I forgot. He said the, of the various ways to diagnose this, I didn't say enough about endoscopic, and he's right. Um, the, the hard part about endoscopic is that uh, it's hard to see up into your sinuses unless you've had sinus surgery, right? So getting in and around and under those little bits of tissue is very difficult. If you've got a raging sinus infection, uh, it's, it's useful. Um, it's, it's also expensive. You know, I mean, it's, it's something that <clears throat> I generally say, look, if you've got all these symptoms, and I think you've got sinusitis, uh, in particular if you have a history of sinusitis, I don't think it's really necessary to charge you more money to do it if we're going to do it anyway. But you're right. I think that it, it, there, is, there is the corollary to that question is what about cultures? Should we do cultures? The hard part about cultures is that it's very hard to get a Q-tip up into your nose and not rub up against things that we know have bacteria in them. So cultures, again, are really primarily useful in the, in the context of patients who have sinus surgery already. Uh, and you can get into the sinus and actually culture the thing causing the uh, infection. 
Does that make sense? Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, generally not. You're asking the big, the antihistamines that you spray in your nose. Can you do that too often? The the thing you know they they talk about that nasal spray is addictive. Boy, don't use that nasal spray. That one is the one they call Afrin. It is an over-the-counter medication. It is the generic name is oxymetalazine. Uh, what's the what's the menthol folks? The the people that make the menthol smell and stuff. It's all basically the same idea. It is a decongestant spray. Okay, those are all over the counter. Now, they're not heroin. I mean, it's not like you know you're not going to be selling the family jewels for this stuff. But it's it's a, a medication that clamps down on the blood vessels that bring blood into the nose. It's like Visine. You, you know, you put this stuff in your eyes and it clamps down on the blood vessels. The problem with this stuff is that it's very temporary. It's addictive because it works great. I mean, you spray this stuff in. 15 minutes later, you can breathe the whole world in. The problem with it is that after about six or eight hours, it wears off, and all the blood that was supposed to be coming in and doing the stuff that the blood was supposed to be doing starts to catch up with you. And then you get what's called a rebound phenomenon, where after those hours, now you're having even worse symptoms. And so then you, know, you get back to this point where you're doing it again six hours later. And I've met people who are doing this seven, eight times a day, and they got one in each pocket and one in the glove compartment, and it, it, it can be a real problem. The biggest problem is that over time, those muscles in the blood vessels wear out, and there's something called rhinitis medicamentosa, which is just a fancy way of saying you are done worn out your nose, and now you got runny nose all the time, and there's no treatment for that. We can't, we can't reverse that symptom. I'll go back on that one. So you're talking about something that's happening inside the globe, so your eyeball. The retina is at the back of your eyeball. His question was about can problems in the sinuses cause problems in the eye. And I'm going to say in, in very broad terms, problems in the sinuses can certainly cause problems in the eye, although it generally doesn't cause problems in the globe, right? So the globe is the, is the white part of your eye, and it contains all of the, the retina and the cornea and the lens and all that stuff. Inside the orbit, the orbit is full of fat and muscles and nerves and the stuff that move your eyeball around. Now, people who get uh, ethmoid sinusitis and frontal sinusitis in particular can get infections of the orbit. There's something called preceptal -cell, pre cellulitis and postceptal cellulitis. And if you get infections of the eye, your eye will generally come all bulging out and it'll swell shut and it looks awful. Uh, that certainly can be from um, uh, ethmoid sinusitis, although I got to tell you, it's very, very uncommon. I mean, I. I haven't seen that since I got here. It was much more common when I was in a great big institution with lots of really sick people. He also asked about invasive fungal sinusitis in the context of bone marrow transplants. <clears throat> Fungus, as a general rule, is not, is not a terribly aggressive form of microorganism. There are obviously huge exceptions to that. So I don't, I don't, I'm not, I don't mean to make a, a definitive statement. That's a very vague statement. Fungus is in your body. So in fact, for, for every cell in your body that has your DNA in it, there are 30 cells that are either fungal or bacterial organisms. You would die a terrible, terrible death if you didn't have bacteria in your body. You couldn't make vitamin K if you didn't have bacteria in your body. So the fungus is there. The, the question is, what does your body do with it? And in the context of bone marrow transplants, we suppress your immune system completely. We kill off everything in your immune system. Right? You have no white blood cells left because we're going to give you new ones. Now, in that period of time, you're susceptible to infections that almost nobody else is susceptible to. And there's a version of sinusitis where you get this, it's called invasive fungal sinusitis. The, the fungus actually invades and blocks off, occludes the blood vessels of the mucosa. And I, I saw a lot of this, actually, when I was in residency, because there was a huge bone marrow transplant program in our residency, uh, or sorry, in our hospital. And what happens is that turbinate, that middle turbinate, turns black. And you, you can touch it, you can monkey around with it, and people don't feel it. Uh, <clears throat> the, the mortality, meaning it's going to kill you, is something like 40 to 50%. It's, it's incredibly dangerous. It doesn't generally go to your retina. It generally goes to your brain and kills you.
So that's why I didn't really talk a lot about it because I probably won't ever see that again. Well, in, in the setting of chronic rhinosinusitis without polyposis, presuming you don't have immune problems or this allergy type thing, generally it's, it's supposed to be kind of a one-time thing. Now, again, generally, I can't guarantee that this is a one-time thing. There are people who have to have revision surgery. The, the, if done well and heals well, it should be sort of a one-time thing. Uh, scarring will change that equation. Uh, uh, retained sinus cells. Uh, and by that I mean, you can imagine that if I go in here and I get part of the way in and it's oozing a lot of blood. And, and I, I want you to keep in mind, when I say a lot of blood, I'm talking on the order of, of tablespoons to cups. A lot of blood to me is a really small amount of blood to just about any other surgeon. But I've got a four millimeter lin window to look through. So one drop of blood to me makes me blind. So generally, when you get to a point where you say, look, this is not safe. I can't go any farther because I can't see safely. So if you're talking about someone like this, it's much more likely that I'm not going to safely get the whole job done. And I would rather, you know, what's the fishing thing? I'd rather cut bait, come back another day if I have to. So a lot of it depends on the, on the particular context or the particular setting or the patient or the symptoms. And man, you had a... I, I generally talk, the decongestants is the afrin. So I generally say, like for instance, when I get a cold. I get a cold, I use a little afrin. I use that to shrink down the lining of the, the sinuses and the lining of that hole. But for less than four days, correct? Exactly. Let, we say less than three days. Less but than three days. So but you use it twice a day and then you do the rinse and you're trying to keep that hole open and wash the snot out so you don't get down to here. Yes, ma'am. Um, it's hard to draw that line. Um, you know, I've had sinus infections and I've had, I mean, people come in and say, I got a headache here and it's from my sinusitis. And I think, well, you haven't got a sinus there, you know. But I've had a sinus infection where my whole bloody head hurts. Lots of people come in and, and talk about dizziness or fuzzy feeling or my head's stuffed up or I feel like I'm swimming in a cloud. Vertigo, do you mean true vertigo? Do you know what I mean by vertigo? Okay, so vertigo, she asked is, can vertigo be caused by a sinus infection? <clears throat> vertigo is what we call the illusory sense of spinning. You think you're spinning around even though obviously you're not, okay? That is typically an ear problem or a brain problem, okay? It is generally not as a result. When we talk about balance problems with sinusitis, you're really more talking about kind of disequilibrium, the feeling like you're, gonna, you're off balance. Sorry. That's a tough call. I mean, I think that it's probably not a sinus infection, right? Because sinus infections don't stick around just during the nighttime. Although, allergies are not a bad guess because if every time he's laying down in his bed, he gets stuffed up, you got to wonder, is it dust mites in the bed sheets or is it something in his pillows or something like that? Um, some people just get really, some people mouth breathe. And so, sorry, I hurt my throat. <coughs> <coughs> so uh, if you mouth breathe, air isn't going through your nose, so the snot isn't evaporating, right? So then you got all this snot that's stuck in your nose, blow your nose out, and if it goes away, you know, generally you're probably not talking about something dangerous, but that's a tougher thing to know. I would. I, the thing is, again, presuming you're keeping the thing clean and you're doing it the way you're supposed to, can't hurt you. Sir? That it is not, although it is related to what we're talking about, because if you can't breathe through your nose, he's asking about those breathe right strips that you put across the bridge of your nose. <clears throat> that, is a, that is a different problem, right? That's something called nasal vestibular stenosis. Again, fancy words, but all it means is the sidewall of your nose collapses in. So you breathe in really hard, you can feel your nose collapse, right? Well, some people, their nose is so weak or narrow, the sidewall of their nose collapses in when they take a breath, and so they feel like they've got obstruction. There is there's a different way to deal with that. There's a surgery, because it's an architectural problem. There is actually a surgery to deal with that. Um, possibly, although um, 
they're, they're sort of different parts of the nose. <coughs> when you're talking about the breathe right, let me see if I can figure out a place I can show you this. Way back at the beginning. <coughs> when you're talking about those breathe right strips, you're talking more about um, this area right in here. Right? This is the nasal sidewall. This is the ala. This is called the alar cartilage. And when that collapses in, you get this vestibular stenosis. Sinusitis all happens up in here. Now, there are a number of points in your nose where your airway gets narrow. So if your obstruction is here, doing the breathe right isn't going to do anything. But again, it's a little thing on your nose. If it makes you breathe better, go for so it. The saline could take it slowing down better than... It probably won't get rid of the swelling. She asked if the saline rinse would take the swelling down. The saline rinse will only get rid of the snot. Uh, only in the sense that if it doesn't sit there and get infected with bacteria, then it'll get better. Oh. But it doesn't, there's nothing inherently therapeutic about washing your nose out, other than it's gratifying. Oh, does chronic sinusitis ever turn into cancer? Uh, <clears throat> no. Uh, I mean, it, I, I'm always very careful to say, no, it can't do that. But no, I've, I've never seen chronic sinusitis turn into cancer. Now that being said, I have seen tumors, usually benign, but I have seen tumors cause sinusitis, right? So if you've got a tumor that's growing and blocking up your, your sinuses, that tumor can block up just like swelling can. So when I, remember we talked about that, the red light, green light thing. One of the main reasons I would ever tell you to have surgery if you have uh, not a lot of symptoms, but CT scan findings, particularly in the setting of findings on one side. Why is one side as bad and not the other? And the big concern there is, what if you got a cancer? What if you got a tumor up in your nose, even if I can't see it, that would explain why you have findings on one side. So especially if you've got risk factors, if you smoke or if, uh, if you have other risk factors for, for cancer in there. Um, in rare instances. The, so he asked, he had uh, what's called a Caldwell Luck procedure. And these were the, the uh, sim, uh, surgeons who did surgery before sinuses. It was very hard to get into the cheek sinus. It still actually is, but at the time, you could make an incision under your lip, lift that up, and, oops, pardon me, uh, and chisel out the bone on the front of the maxillary sinus. And then you could look from under your lip into the cheek sinus, and you could get sinus disease out. Um, I, I do, I've done that on occasion. Um, there are only specific indications for doing it, one of them being a tumor in that sinus. So that's one reason I do it. The other reason is I, there, every once in a while, if you look here, these are where your tooth roots are. And I've had a couple of people where they had a dental extraction and they get this wicked, horrible sinusitis on one side, and there's a, a, a remnant of a dental root there. So that can happen too. Um, it can be consistent with uh, plugging of your sinuses. So for instance, if, if this opening is very narrow, but these are widely patent, you can get pressure in here. Now there, uh, there was an interesting study that looked at people who have pain and pressure in here versus pain and pressure here. I'm sorry, I was supposed to repeat the question. He, um, he asked if, if pressure here but being able to breathe fine out of your nose is sinusitis. So it's, ba it's not an infection, but that's not to say it's not your sinuses. It's a little harder because now we get into this question of, well, your CT scan looks fine. Well, but is it sinusitis? Well, I don't know, because your CT scan doesn't necessarily say. So at that point, you kind of go through well, let's treat it. Let's see if we can, we can do some decongestant sprays. If we open this up and that hole stays open, albeit only for a couple hours, if that makes it get better, that's one way of doing it. The other way is, I mean, there are, I, on Monday, I, I did a surgery for someone similar to like that because he just said, I, I got to try something. This hurts. I, I, I want to I wanna try something. A thickening of the sinus wall, indication for surgery or just infection? Um, it kind of goes back to this one right here. I don't really care 
what your CT scan says. I use your CT scan as a map only. If your CT scan says the whole thing is socked in, it looks awful, right? It looks like this. I had a guy that looked just like this, full of polyps. I could see the polyps in his nose. You go, no, man, I feel pretty good. Why do surgery if you feel pretty good, right? I mean, surgery is to make your life better, not worse. So uh, it doesn't, I mean, it, the, another detail that I didn't include here so far, but about 30% of people will have a thickening of their sinus. There's something called a mucosal. A mucosal is, is a, a snot gland that gets plugged up and it blows up like a balloon and it's full of snot. So that's very, very common. And as long as it's not blocking up this hole, it doesn't matter. So we don't do anything. Generally, they can be, they can be. Generally, yes, they are. She asked, are sinus headaches in the spots where your sinuses are? <clears throat> Generally, yes, although I've had sinus headaches where the whole bloody thing hurts. So it, your body actually isn't that good at detecting where are you touching things, right? That's why abdominal pain is so difficult to diagnose because there's basically one nerve that looks down in your guts and it says, it hurts. And you say, where? And you say, I don't know, it just hurts. And so the same thing is kind of true in your sinuses. You don't have very good what we call spatial discrimination. You have very good spatial discrimination on your fingers or your lips. But you're not as good at doing that in your, in your face or inside. <coughs> Sir? Uh, that's a, I mean, the, his initial question is, uh, is there a difference between a cyst and a mucosal? and a tumor. Yeah, there are dramatic differences between those. Uh, the cyst and the mucosal are largely the same, I'm sorry, but they are not tumors. They're normal tissue. They're just plugged up and blown up like a balloon. Again, 30% of people have those. This is on the side that wasn't involving this. Correct. It's very difficult to say you have that thing, thus it's there. It's causing this, right? And there's a, there's a, a, a legal... No, no, I know, but you're talking about the singing thing. Yes. He, he mentioned that when he sings, he feels like that's plugged up. Um, there's a legal term called uh, post hoc ergo propter hoc, after, therefore, because of. And in fact, that's almost never true, right? I washed my car so it rained. It's got nothing to do with it, right? And so you have to be very, very careful with medical testing what it's telling you. All it says is there's a bump there. It says nothing about why it's there what it's doing, do you feel it, is it causing problems? Which is why, you know, you drive down the road and you see this, hey, get your full body CT scan. Terrible idea, right? You'll find something, I guarantee you, a doctor will find something if we look enough. The problem is, you could have lived the rest of your life without us ever looking at that. My brother's a radiologist, and he thinks those things are just a malignancy. No pun intended, but... <clears throat> yeah. um, does humidifying air help with the swelling in your nose? Pro probably not. I mean, it, it may help with the dryness. One caveat to that is a lot of people have these humidifiers that look like old jalopies. So if you're humidifying mold-ridden air, I would strongly advise against doing that. But no, humidification won't change the inflammation. It'll just change the dryness. So if the snot is really thick because it's dry, it might help that. There are no studies that look at does a humidifier make it less likely to have a sinusite infection or any of that stuff. It makes you feel better as long as you're taking good care of the thing and cleaning it out with bleach, etc. Go for it if it's making you feel better, but it's, it's, there's no proof that it's going to stop it. Um, this kind of goes back to, she said, is it unusual for a sinus infection to cause an ear infection? This goes back to that whole eustachian tube thing. So in the back of the nose, uh, is the opening to the eustachian tube right here. So the eustachian tube goes up to the ear. Sinus infections cause inflammation. Inflammation of the opening to the eustachian tube shuts the eustachian tube. You can't pop your ears, right? You're doing this thing, and you can't clear the, the air into and the fluid out of your ears. Uh, it can, in particular, a bacterial infection, if there's a lot of uh, bacteria in here, uh, it can certainly go up there. And actually, when we look at this, these three bacteria that are the most common causes of sinusitis, 
are also the most common causes of otitis media, ear infections, middle ear infections. They're generally not uh, sinusitis, although some people get what we call rhinitis, which is really just dripping out of your nose. So he, he asked, can people who have CPAP for sleep apnea get more sinusitis? It generally doesn't, as long as you're, again, as long as you're taking care of the machine and there's not mold and bacteria and stuff in there. Um, it doesn't cause infections per se, but having that pressure in there, especially when it's high pressures, people will sometimes get this feeling of they take their CPAP off in the morning and they'll get this drainage out of their nose during the day. And it's, it's probably to do with the pressure that they're putting in there just to keep you breathing at night. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. Try a lazy boy. No, I, um, the, the one, her question is largely, she blows her nose in the morning. Is this because she's laying flat? It is probably not related to the sinuses because, again, you look at that, the picture of this flow. Snot flows up against gravity to get out. Those brooms will sweep it out. It doesn't matter if you're hanging by your heels. It'll still go towards that natural ostium. So laying flat versus sitting up is not going to help. Now, there are other questions. The whole cough thing is a much different question, right? If you've got allergies and the stuff is dripping down, it doesn't matter if you're laying this way or this way or this way. It's going to go drip down the back of your throat. But reflux is definitely a question. And what they're probably talking about is if you sleep with your head elevated, gravity keeps the stomach contents down, and you're less likely to have reflux. Yeah, but I don't care how clean your mom is. She's got dust mites in her bed, too. <laughs> right. So they're ubiquitous. You can't, you can't not have them. You can bleach your sheets, and you can do all that stuff. But in general, you're still going to have some dust mites. Dust mites live on what we call exfoliated skin. Right? So if you sleep on sheets, there are dust mites there. You don't, you don't have an option. So, I'm sorry, somebody else had a... You can certainly do whatever. She asks if you have this bad sinus headache and the sinus rinse and a couple other things are not helping. Your options are basically do whatever makes you feel better. Um, it's fine to take Tylenol Motrin as long as you're okay with it. Uh, you just got to kind of come in and take a look and try and figure out. I mean, is it actually your sinuses that are causing the headache? I'd stop the coffee. No, I'm just kidding. I, there is, he asked, is there any coffee apparently makes his sinuses? There's no known connection between sinusitis and coffee, uh, at least not that I know of. Yeah. One last question? All right. Have a wonderful night. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Oh, whoa, whoa. Uh, hang on. I guess there are door, there are door prizes. My golly. Who you got? Dorothy Sherburn. Is she here? she take off? Oh, that's what happens when you leave early. Uh, Al Esquivire. Sir, the proud owner of a first aid kit. <laughs>